God has been laying on my heart lately that we cannot preach the mercy of God without the truth of God, as we talked about in science school this morning, Joe, but it's also very important for me to preach the mercy of God along with his truth. The two are inseparable. And I think there are times and seasons in our life and with the people in the world we come across that are the brokenness and the hurt and the things that sin does to us in this world, whether we even choose it or not, we need to be reminded of that grace. We need to be healed. We need to be loved and comforted. And today as we look at Scripture, turn to Matthew chapter 4, if you will. I think the Lord is going to have a very comforting, grace-filled message for us. But also invitation, incredible call from Jesus. My friend Don came back last week and he brought with him a gift for me that has had me in the mood for one of my favorite activities ever since. Thank you for that, Don. Those, those really nice salmon rods will get put to good use, I promise. Spring is in the air, and unless you're a diehard steelheader fisherman, which I'm not, you kind of have to wait for the warmer weather to come in to do the stuff that I love. I love rivers. I grew up on a blue ribbon trout stream. And so my uncle taught me how to fish with a fly rod, a spinning rod, and I grew up doing that, and I can do that here. I can walk through my garage, grab my rod, walk to a creek anywhere, and plunk it in, and away I go. And it's been a long winter. I now know what you folks mean when you say winter is long. I'm from Minnesota, okay? It's still 30 below there and three feet of snow. March is just another month of, of, of winter. But when you say winter is long here, it means that it rains, and it's gray, and then some days it rains and it's gray. Yeah. <laughs> then there's other days where it's kind of just like black and it downpours. But we've had a few nice days lately, but winter is long, isn't it? And there's been some other things, as you alluded to today, winter has been hard on some of you in more ways than one. And I want to acknowledge to you this morning, whether you're a visitor here today or whether you know me or not, God knows you. And I know enough about the human condition to know that you come here with your burdens and your baggage and your struggles in life that we all have. God knows that. And you are in the right place for that today. The church is a hospital, in a way, to heal the wounded and to bind with the brokenhearted. Jesus said, he quoted Isaiah, said that's the reason that he came for it. So we're going to talk a little bit about fishing today. And you are the fish. And Jesus is the fisherman. And then he calls you to do the same work that he does. Are you got your Bibles ready? Matthew chapter 4, beginning of verse 18. And then we'll read a cross-reference as well. As Jesus was walking along the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two of the brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. You know what I love about the fact that there are four Gospels? That means we can often have four parallel stories repeated from another eyewitness account. And so we have that a little bit later in Luke chapter 5. You see a little bit different story of that, and I invite you to turn there if you want, just for another flavor and some more detail that really fleshed this story out. What did Jesus actually do when he called those four fishermen that day? Luke chapter 5, beginning, I believe, in verse 2. But we'll start at the beginning of the chapter. He's already preaching the good news. He's already gone around and says in Luke chapter 4, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to other towns also, because that is why I was sent. So he had been going around preaching, and he had not called his disciples yet. But one day he was preaching, and there were so many people all around him, listening to the word of God. It says in verse 1, he saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little from shore. And he sat down and he taught the people. 
from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into deep water and let down the nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. For he and all his companions were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, Don't be afraid. From now on you will catch men. So they pulled their boats up to shore, left everything, and followed him. What a story, isn't it? I'd say that was a good day for fishing. Jesus approaches these men, who I'm sure have heard of him. They might know who he was. They don't know him. They haven't spent time with him. But I can guarantee you that he knows them. And so today with you, I want to take a look at Jesus' call of discipleship. He went around choosing his disciples. He called them and said, you, follow me. You, follow me. You, follow me. And whether it was James and John, whether it was Simon and Andrew, whether it was Matthew, the tax collector, whatever he found them doing, he said, come on, come with me now. And it says, the, 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 the language of the Bible always is, immediately they left whatever they were doing behind them and got up and went with him. Let's take a look today at Jesus' call for discipleship because I promise you today he does it the same way. And he is going around seeking, drawing, wooing, calling, those that he loves and desires. And I hope he's done it to you. That's why you're here. Maybe he is. Maybe you hear his voice today. Scripture tells us if you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart. Don't plug your ears. Don't turn away from the voice of Jesus that is calling you. Jesus said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. We're going to break down just that simple phrase of Scripture itself. And let Scripture speak for itself because I think it is potent and it is living and it is powerful. <clears throat> Let's get you a bigger slide up here, huh? There you go. I like what this one tells you better. You see everything here, right? Oh, good. No, you don't. That's what I want. Let's take a look at Jesus' call. He goes around and says, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. He didn't say, Hey, would you like to follow me? Or please, come follow me. Or our handout flyers saying, I'll be here in the street corner Friday night, 7 o'clock every week. It's both a command and an invitation. Jesus as a son of God, Jesus as creator God, he went around specifically to people that he chose and said, you, come with me. You come with me. So we see in the words of Christ, it is both a command to follow Jesus and an invitation. Who is this man that speaks like no other, who does miracles, who can control nature and calm storms and fill my nets to the point where they break when I'm the expert fisherman and I haven't been able to get anything all day and all night? Who is the strange person? I'm sure their curiosity was piqued. So it's also an invitation. We in modern day America, actually anywhere in this little globe, we like to see ourselves as in control of the choices that we make. But we often forget that the sovereignty of God dictates, demands, is worthy of giving commands. In fact, let's look at some verses today. I'm going to have you look them up for me. Could somebody please look up? John chapter 6, verse 44. Thank you, Teresa. They're all in the same book. I made it easy for you. John 14, 6. And John 15, 16. 14, 6. 14, 6. All right. One of my favorite verses of all time. And Joe, you've got John 15, 6. I'll call upon you in a moment. John 
Jesus called discipleship, and we're, this is the first Sunday of several that we're going to examine this discipleship program that Jesus has created for all of us. But we have to begin with the invitation to follow him. We have to, you have to have a starting point of a personal call by Jesus himself to follow him. You realize that? He didn't send a messenger. He didn't hang up brochures. He went face to face, eye to eye, person to person, and said, I want you, and you, and you. Come with me. And something in their hearts said, yes, Lord. And they went. Do you realize how unusual that is? If somebody, if I showed up at your house, said, you, leave, drop whatever you're doing, and come with me. You're like, okay, hang on. I got some questions for you first. Who are you? Where are we going? How long are we going there? What are we going to do? They didn't ask those questions. And Jesus didn't tell them. He said, follow me. And I'll tell you what will happen. I'll make you fishers of men. Their curiosity is piqued. Okay? It's a personal call initiated by Jesus. You follow me. You, Peter. You, John. You, James. You follow me. You realize that? There were all kinds of men in the... Jewish days in the Roman Empire that were starting movements, that were starting religions, that were causing uprisings. They had little followings and little movements and little clubs everywhere. The Romans were used to that. Jesus didn't say, come follow me and I'll, I'll teach you my new little system of health and wealth gospel. Well, come follow me and I'll show you my new little program of how to have your best life now or how to lose 10 pounds in 10 minutes. Okay? I always tell people I'm not a religious person. I hate religion. Well, guess what? Jesus did too. The call of Jesus to be discipled by him is one of a relationship. That is the heart and that is the, the essence of what it means to follow Jesus. It means know me. Come be with me. Come live life with me. Come watch me. Come listen to me. Come see what I do and copy it. The call, the invitation he was giving was not just one to follow them today and, and tomorrow, you know, meet me at such and such a time. It was like, leave whatever you're doing and come with me every day until I say we're done. They didn't all know what they were getting into, these disciples. But it was a relationship. Follow me. Not a new religion. A new kingdom, yes. And in chapter 5 of Matthew, he actually starts to talk about it the platform for his new kingdom, and how he's going to be different. You've heard it said by those of old time, you've read the prophets, you've, read the, you've heard the scribes, but I say unto you, and he lays this whole new platform of thinking and living and loving and knowing God that nobody had ever heard before. And when he spoke, the crowds just sat in awe with their mouths dropped open. Not because he was so charismatic, not because he was so powerful, but it's like going to church, it's like going to a meeting to do a book club and the author shows up and says, here's what I wrote thousands of years ago, and here's what I meant. He knew what he was talking about because he was there when it was written. It was his heart and his mind that he was explaining. And says he taught with authority, not like the scribes and Pharisees. Yeah, because he wrote it. You want, and this was an invitation to these fishermen to know God and to walk and to be friends with the God of the universe. And they were just starting to get little glimpses, little tastes of what this strange man, the Son of God, could do. And they were in awe. You saw, you saw Peter's reaction to the power of God displayed. His first reaction was, wow, who is this guy? He's amazing. And then it was, look at himself in his gut. Oh, man, look at me. I'm not worthy of this. I'm not ready for this. Lord, I don't deserve this. You're too magnificent. You're too holy. You're too amazing. For me, I'm not worthy. Jesus says, don't be afraid. See, when we come into the presence of God and we actually experience for ourselves the love and the wonder of who he is, that's my first response. A little bit of guilt. Remember, we studied Moses a while ago. When he came to the burning bush and stood in awe of God's presence, he actually trembled and fell on his face and said, Lord, you don't want me. You don't understand. I can't handle it. I'm not good enough. But Jesus says, that's exactly why I pick you. That's exactly why I want you to walk with me hand in hand, heart in heart. Follow me, and I will make you 
fishers of men. We'll talk about that in a second. Let's read some of these verses. John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up in the last day. Whoa, did you all hear that? Jesus says, no one can come unto me unless my Father draws him. And I like that verb, draw. What do we draw? What's he drawing? A net, how about? That's a fishing term right there. God is casting out his kingdom net, and he's hauling in the souls of men and women. And it says, again, this is contrary, flies in the face of free will of man, and it's my life, my choice, a lot. But Jesus says, you can't even come to me unless I pick you first. Unless I draw you to myself. Unless I give you that. If I extend my grace to you to initiate a relationship, which Jesus is doing here in this passage, he's coming to them and saying, I want you, and I want you, and I want you. Yes, I know there's a balance there. We need to respond to God's grace and respond to his call. And we have a free will there to activate. We do need to make a choice. The disciples could have said no. Some of them did. We'll read about that in Matthew chapter 19 and other places. He, Jesus called many people to follow him. And they were like, yes, but not yet. I'm not ready. I want some stuff to do first. I've got to go bury my father. I could talk about that all day, but they weren't ready. By the way, his father wasn't dead. His father was still alive. He said, I've got to take care of my father until he passes. I've got to do all the obligations of his son, and then I'll come follow you. One was a rich man who loved his riches so much that Jesus said, you only lack one thing, and that's to sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and follow me. Why did Jesus specify that? Was it because money was bad? No, because he knew that in that young man's heart there was only one thing, there was one idol, there was one object of all his affections that kept him from following Jesus with all his heart. He said, that's the one thing I want. And then you come follow me. And he couldn't do it. There are many people that Jesus called who said no. Much to their loss and his heartache. But none of us can say, yes, I want you, Jesus. Yes, I see you, Jesus. Yes, I desire you, unless he puts that desire in us first. Jesus parted heaven and came down seeking us, to seek and to save that which was lost. I am dead. I am lost. I am blind in the darkness of my sin. How do I even have a heart to seek after God? I don't. <laughs> unless he extends his grace to me and his Holy Spirit quickens in me a hunger and a thirst to see and to look and respond to his initiated grace. We call that, some people call that, irresistible grace. Where Jesus in his love and his wise choosing chases you down and says, I want you, I love you, I seek you. We say, Lord, here I am. Thank you for loving me first. You realize that, right? No one can come to God except the Father draws him. All right, John 14, 6. My, one of my, I, I hate to say my favorite verse in the whole Bible because that's not right. But it's close. Glenn? I testify to all those things you're saying. Someday I'll share it with you. But this is just really pivotal to me. Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Amen. There are 4,200 really 200. And I studied religions in school. I learned about a lot of them, but I don't remember that many. There's more growing every day. This is the only religion that somebody says this. I am God. I am the way. I am the truth. Some people say, I know the way. I'll, I'll tell you the truth. I'll show you things. Nobody says, it's all about me. Unless you're a total crazy lunatic liar filled with Satan. Or telling the absolute truth, which is what I choose to believe Jesus is doing in John 14, 6. I am the way. It's about me. I am the truth. I am life. If any of you are hungry, thirsty, starving for life today, Jesus says, I am the only one that will do that for you. I believe even as Christians we forget that. Ken, when he was here last week, Ken Luce, he commented on that. He commented on our human tendency to follow systems, to follow religions, to ascribe our worthiness, to uh, ascribe our surety of salvation based upon a belief system that we have. Well, I know I'm a Christian because I prayed this prayer and I said these words and I, I do these things. There's my checklist. Pretty good. Or I know I'm saved because, hey, I was born in a Christian family. Or because I'm Baptist, because I'm Catholic, because I'm... You plug it in. No, 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 no. It's a personal 
call initiated by Jesus himself that says, you, follow me. And that's why all my life, I have held a stronger and stronger belief that it is a personal, walking, daily relationship with a real person. His name is Jesus. I know him. And he talks to me through his word and his Holy Spirit, and we grow together, and without him I can do nothing. What does John 15, 16 say? You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and whatsoever you ask the Father in my name, he will give you. That is an incredible, powerful promise. Jesus reminded them in John 15. John 15 is some of the most powerful teaching that Jesus ever gave his disciples because he's spending his last few moments with them before his betrayal, before his crucifixion. He's telling them the good stuff. If you want to learn about the heart of Jesus, read John 14, 15, and 16. But he reminds them here, remember, you didn't choose me. I came and found you. I chose you from before the foundations of the world that you would belong to me and that my desire for you is that you will be fruitful that you will point the way to me and the life of me in you that made you a growing, fruitful tree. I'm the vine, you're the branches. Apart from me, you can do nothing. But I've chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. Jesus' goal for you in discipleship is that you have a very fruitful, full life. Jesus said in John 10, I know my sheep. I'm the good shepherd. I give my life for my sheep. I have come not to take their life, not to steal from them, not to burden them, but that they might have life. And have it what? Abundant <coughs> life. I love that phrase. It's very important. That when Jesus gives us his call, his invitation to discipleship, we realize that that's what he is calling us to, inviting us to, a fruitful, living, abundant life, of which he is the source of all things. It's not a religion. It's not a system. It's not a series of commands. It's not anything that you can hang your hat on or pat your back at all. It is merely and purely a relationship with Jesus. Do you know him today? Is he in you? And even more importantly, does he know you? So, Zach? Yes, ma'am. I think out of all the Gospels, John's probably the most like relational. It's all about relation with Jesus and him with us. And I think in the Old Testament, at least what makes that for me is Isaiah seems like that. It's like the yes. most personal letter God has directly to our hearts in Isaiah. And a lot of what we're talking about, like Jesus choosing us, is very much the same in Isaiah. Do you mind if I read a passage? Go right ahead, because we call it the Gospel of Isaiah for a reason. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in 43, this is probably the most like profound scripture that's affected my life. I know where you're going. Yep. It says in 43.1, um, listen to the Lord who created you. Do not be afraid, for I have ransomed you. I have called you by name, and you are mine. And then it goes on in 3 to say, For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I gave Egypt as a ransom for your freedom. I gave Ethiopia and Sebia in your place. Others were given in exchange for you. I traded their lives for yours. Because you are precious to me, you are honored, and I love you. And the fact that, and that applies today, like he... He has purchased us. He has given other people's lives for ours because of his love for us. And in 44 it says, Do not be afraid, my servant, for I have chosen you. I will pour out water to quench your thirst and irrigate your purchased fields. And it talks of, it just keeps going on to talk about how we are his chosen one. He's called us by name, by our name, that we are his. We're not just a number in the crowd. We're not just a group of people. But as individuals, you know, he loves us. And I just think that's very, I don't know, like well, it just pops right out and just pierces me. Well, Isaiah 43 is another one of my favorite passages. So thank you also for bringing in the Old Testament to show us that the heart of God, the character of God, has never changed. But he has always been the shepherd who has parted heaven and earth to pursue those that he loves and the way he places his name on I love that. I appreciate it. Do you see how active the language in Matthew chapter 4 and Luke chapter 5 is? And immediately and straightway, I don't care what version you read, it all reads the same. There wasn't a delay, there wasn't a pause, there wasn't like a, uh, okay, give me a, give me a day, i got to think about it. I mean, when somebody calls you to make a major decision, 
Don't, don't they give you a grace period where you contemplate your major life change before you say, yeah, I'll go for it? Jesus does not. And those who the Spirit draws to him, the Father draws to him, they do not. They, know, they see a good thing when they see it. And they follow, their hearts respond. They had faith and obedience to react immediately to the invitation and the command that they were given. I think Jesus knew their hearts, he knew their faith, he knew those were the people that he wanted, but he also gave them that grace to respond to it. But I want you to know when God comes to you, when the Lord comes to you and says, here I am, I love you, come be with me. We don't dare say, eh, no, not yet. Let me think about it. Let me get back to you on that tomorrow. I mean, that's how we do. We're slow to make decisions. Why is that? Why is it that we're so slow to make a decision? It's based on trust. Okay, I've been trying to sell a car back in Minnesota since we moved here in July. It's been parked there in multiple different family members' homes. I feel so bad for them. They're trying to market it and sell it Facebook here, that place or the other. I've had multiple offers on it. I've got a guy who made an offer on it here yesterday. He offered me way less than I wanted. I talked to him on the phone last night. Actually, we got our phones to work. I couldn't believe it. Um, and we discussed it. I got to know him. He got to know me. And we both agreed we kind of like each other, got to know each other better. So we trust each other better. And so I said, let me think about your offer. Even that offer, I said, give me a day to think about it. So I need to call him back later today and tell him, yeah, I'll sell it to you for that part. No, I won't. Mm -hmm. But even just that relationship of discussing it with each other. Oh, you're a pastor. Oh, you're a dad with kids in college. You're buying it for your son. Da, 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 da. We, we connected. Even things like that, though, we have a pause. Jesus says, follow me. Follow me now. Leave what you have, and we'll get to that next week, and we'll get to that more in a little bit, even today. Jesus is asking for a lot here, but he's keeping it simple for them. And they trusted him. Okay? They had faith to do what he said, to believe him, and to go. Do I? Do you? Because Jesus has placed the same call of discipleship on you. Follow me. Where are we going? No. Follow me. What are we going to do? Follow me. <laughs> Who are you? Come find out. That's the whole point. <laughs> Will you go immediately? Don't put off the voice of God. Don't put off the invitation of Jesus to trust him. Do it today. It says today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today is the day of salvation, Scripture tells us. When it comes to hearing the voice of God, the Holy Spirit, the word has always been about don't delay. Don't delay. And these men did not. They went immediately and they followed Jesus, thereby demonstrating their faith and obedience that was going to grow. It's an all-in call. They left their nets. James and John left their father sitting there with a pile of work to do. Hey, boys, where are you going? Get back here. Your mom's got dinner on tonight. Bye, Dad. Just them leaving for that moment actually symbolized a lot more. He said, leave your nets. You're not going to be fishermen anymore. You're not going to be the people you were anymore. I'm going to make you something else. I'm going to make you a fisher of men. This is a major life change call that they were receiving in that moment. And they went. It was a whole new beginning. They didn't know all what it was going to entail. But do you realize that? How these men responded to this all-in call. They left their nets. They left their father. They left their former way of life. And they started a whole new life that day following Jesus, this guy they just met, but who God had wooed them to, and they showed, they saw the power of God, they saw what he was able to do, and they said, that's the guy. We choose him above everything else. That is what it means to be a disciple. It's an all-in call that says, Jesus, I trust you, I choose you, I forsake everything else. Whatever I'm familiar with, whatever I associated myself with, whatever I built my life on, whatever I did, it's all behind me. Remake me. And that is, actually, could somebody please look at John 6.68? Glenn, could you look that up? Because I was thinking of you. John 6.68. When I picked it out. Um, religions in the world. Did you know that? I didn't even know that. 40. Here we are, a few years later. Peter and John, the fishermen, standing there before the Sanhedrin, the 70 rulers of Israel. And, they, and the leaders say to them, don't preach in Jesus' name anymore. Don't you know we have the power to imprison you? Don't you know we have the power to stone you? Don't you know we're going to kill you to keep doing this? They said we must. We've been totally convinced ourselves that there is no other name on earth 
given among us whereby we can truly be saved. Jesus is it. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We will not stop. And it says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they, they realized that these are fishermen from Galilee. They're not trained in the word. They're not scribes. They're not Pharisees like us. They're not leaders. They're not rulers. They're poor guys. They're, they're fishermen from poor protection. Well pass. Thorn Bay. They marveled at them. And they remember, that's right. They were with Jesus. They're his. He transformed them as his disciples. What a powerful truth that they lived out. I don't know much about netting fish. I just do the old whoosh kind, and sometimes I catch fish even. Usually it's rocks and sticks and trees and myself. <laughs> so we understand the whole baited hook thing, right? Or the, or the flashy lure. Anybody here ever fished with a commercial fishing net? Be familiar with that. James has. I've heard some of his stories. Not many of us. So there's some relearning about when God says, come with me and I'll make you fishers of men, what the whole casting the net out there and dragging the load in looks like and what that means in God's kingdom. I think there's a very apt picture there when you get to the boat and you start sorting the fish, what that means for the kingdom of God too and who the fisherman is and who sorts them. Not me. But it's very much akin to the, sermon, or the, the parable of the sower where we go and we scatter the seed, the king of God, liberally to whatever soil it lands on. There's something to that connection there. We're going to learn about that as we study this discipleship, what it means to be a fisher of men. Next week we'll start looking at the second point of the cost of discipleship. And I'm really excited about exploring with you what creating a culture of discipleship looks like in the believer's life. Mm -hmm. Looks like right here in Church of Thorn Bay, in the town of Thorn Bay. Mm -hmm. What is it going to look like developing that culture where Jesus said, follow me? Or as Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. Mm -hmm. All the disciples now learned also how to make disciples and they did that in their life. They followed that model and they had people that followed them as they followed Christ. And that is my exhortation to you is don't... There's a lot of people in churches who follow this pastor, that teacher, that favorite author, that guy on the TV. They follow him for a while, and then something happens. He falls off his pendulum, or excuse me, his podium, and the pendulum swings in the far direction. Oh, I hate church. I hate that guy. I hate, I hate Christianity. I was all lied and confused. Do you get what I'm saying? Have you seen the pendulum swing before? They go from one extreme to the next because they're following not the shepherd, not Jesus. Jesus said, follow me. And all those who understood what that meant said, follow me as I follow Jesus. My friends, you and I, myself included, we need to follow people. We need to have people in our life that mentor and disciple us in as much as they live and look like Christ. And we need to have people in our life that we are mentoring and discipling to follow us as much as we follow Christ. Which means we're going to have to be gleaning, you have to be wise, and have to be humble too. Right? Don't put each other up on a pedestal. It will break. I will break. I have. And I would disappoint all of you. But follow those who follow Christ in as much as they do. And make sure that there's somebody in your life that you're discipling. And so I look forward to going through this course in discipleship with you. Because what was the command the church was given? Go and make disciples. And you saw that Jesus made them. They're not born, okay? Disciples are not born. They're made. They're a masterpiece that's not made overnight. They're shaped in life. All of us are on that path of transformation and being made by the personal hand of Jesus on you. I'm excited to see what you will become. He says he will complete it, doesn't he, in Philippians. I am confident of this very thing that he which began a good work in you will bring it to completion, will perfect it in the day of Christ. That means when we stand before him as our judge on that final day, he'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Or as the story I... I heard you put it in the oven, and when it's baked just right, pull it out, and it's well done. I'm being baked right now, I don't know about you. I'm not finished yet, but the very hand of Jesus himself is engineering that. He is in your life. Listen to his voice. What's he saying to you today? Is he saying, follow me? 
Is there anybody here today who, do, who has not responded to the personal call of Jesus? I'm taking it out of context a little bit, but you've heard Revelation 3.20 many times, haven't you? I stand at the door and knock. Behold. If anyone will hear my voice and will open the door, I will come in. And I will sup with him and he with me. I'll be with him and he'll be with me. Do you hear the voice of Jesus calling and knocking today? Respond to the call of the Savior. He loves you. It's obviously an immediately a call of transformation. All in. Not an experiment. Not a test. Trust Him. He's the only one you can trust. Today, if you've already followed Him, you're like me. You're on the path of discipleship. Mm-hmm. Don't forget that you left your nets behind. Don't forget that you traded in your old life for a new one. Don't confuse the two. Don't drag the old life back in and try to, to mix and match a life that suits you. But trust the one who calls you to transform you, to remake you. That you be transformed, not conformed, but transformed by the renewing of your mind. It says in Romans 12, 1 and 2. That you may prove then what the excellent and perfect will of God is. Oh Lord Jesus, thank you for this very simple but profound verse. Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. You've done so much for us to do so. You've chosen us yourself. You've sought us out. You've sacrificed your whole life. You've conquered sin and the grave and ours so that we can belong to you, so that we can be free, so we can have a new life. All the old things are passed away, it says. Behold, all things are become new. Mm -hmm. May we grab hold of that promise today. Would you save souls, Lord Jesus, even today? Comfort the brokenhearted. Bind up those that are, that are wounded and weary. You say, Lord, all you that are weary and heavy laden, come unto me and I will give you rest. Amen. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Thank you, Father, for being so good to us. Our hearts are yours. And as a church, as a community, we desire to follow this call of discipleship, to count its cost to be yours until the end, to see what you will do with us in this place. We ask for your glory. We ask for your favor. We ask for your will to be done among us. Now in Jesus' name. Amen.